And we're live. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rira, and on behalf of Romans Bookstore, I'd like to welcome you all to our virtual presentation of Regarding Paul R. Williams, A Photographer's View with John and Ireland. Uh, if you would like to submit a question for the audience Q&A, please use the Ask a Question function at the very bottom of the screen. You can also vote for any questions you find interesting, and they will make their way to the very top of the list. Also, if you're considering supporting our bookstore by purchasing a copy of Regarding Paul R. Williams, please click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. Uh, it, will it will direct you to our website where you can complete your purchase. And uh, with that said, let me introduce our speaker for tonight. Jana Ireland holds an MFA from the UCLA Department of Art and a BFA from the Department of Photography and Imaging at NYU. Ireland is the 2013 recipient of the Snyder Prize presented by the Museum of Contemporary Photography, Columbia College, Chicago. Her work has been shown in solo exhibitions in Los Angeles, San Francisco, New Orleans, and Chicago, and in group exhibitions across the United States and internationally. And she has also been published in Aperture, Harper's, Art Papers, Vice, and the LA Times. And with that said, I'm going to turn the screen over to Jana. Enjoy the talk, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I used to live about two blocks away from Romans in Pasadena, and it became sort of a secret dream of mine to one day publish a book and talk about it at Romans. So it's very special for me to be here tonight. I'm sorry that we can't all be in the store together, but I'm glad that we can be in this virtual space tonight. Um, let's see, what should, I, what should I talk about first? All right, so my book is called Regarding Paul R. Williams. It was kind of a challenge coming up with the title because the title had to contain the name Paul R. Williams so that people understood that it was a book about his work it had to communicate that it was a book of art by an artist versus, versus a book that was, say, a biography or uh, some kind of encyclopedic guide to his work. And my publishers came up with the title Regarding Paul R. Williams, which I think is really brilliant. Regarding means looking at, talking about, thinking about, as well as having regard for, which I certainly do for Paul Williams. So the title kind of encompasses all of that. And then by calling it a photographer's view, the idea is that you will understand that it's me looking at his work and interpreting it for you to look at and come up with your own interpretation of. I'm going to read a text that I wrote about the work that became the introduction to the book. While I read the text, I'll play a slideshow so that you can see some of the work that's in the book. And then when I'm done, I'll talk a little bit more about some various things about the project. And then I will open things up for questions and Rira will read some of the questions that you have for me. So please do ask them if you have them. All right, I'm gonna start sharing. I'll see how smoothly I can do this. And I'll get, get going. For the past several years, I've been photographing buildings designed by Paul Revere Williams, the legendary Los Angeles architect who practiced for 50 years and planned nearly 3,000 buildings. He was the first black certified architect west of the Mississippi and the first black member of the American Institute of Architects. In 2017, 37 years after his death, 44 years after his retirement, and 95 years after his induction to the American Institute of Architects, Williams became the first black architect to win the AIA Gold Medal, one of the highest honors in the field of architecture. My study of Paul R. Williams began in the summer of 2016, when Barbara Bester, a renowned architect in her own right, asked if I would be interested in photographing some of his buildings. She had gotten my name from my former professor the exceptional photographer, James Welling. I jumped at the chance, even though Barbara was a stranger, Williams's name was only vaguely familiar, and my knowledge of architecture was limited to a brief elective unit on Greek columns in sixth grade. At its core, my work is about the expression of black identity in American culture, 
and I felt an immediate connection to Williams's story. I am not an architectural photographer, nor a documentary photographer. Most of my photographs are fictional scenes that relate to my own experiences. In Milk and Honey, for example, my husband, children, and I play alternate reality versions of ourselves, carefully posed in my husband's grandfather's well-appointed mid-century house as though it were our own. When I said yes to Barbara that summer, I had no idea how to go about photographing a building, let alone dozens of them. What I did have was a one-year-old son and a brand new full-time administrative job at USC. I was struggling to figure out how I was gonna to continue to fit art into my life. As busy as I already was, I was happy to have a new assignment. That initial email from Barbara came at exactly the right time. A few months later, pregnant with my second son, I began my Paul Williams work. The decision to photograph in black and white was intuitive, almost automatic, and not tied to any sense of nostalgia for bygone eras. I simply wanted to mute distractions like the color of a wall or carpet and draw attention instead to Williams's voluptuous curves and tidy lines. Most architectural photography is designed to sell a space. It asks, what purpose does a building or room serve? What does it look like as a whole? My goal was to create an experience of Williams's work that was about the feeling of living in his spaces and loving them. Williams thought about every little detail, and I felt that seeking out those details would be a fitting way to honor him. I searched for clues about Paul Williams in his buildings. Paul Revere Williams was born in 1894 to parents who moved from Memphis to Los Angeles for the promised curative properties of the climate. Both had tuberculosis, and both were dead before Williams's fifth birthday. Williams and his older brother ended up in separate foster homes. The woman who raised Paul Williams recognized his potential and nurtured his skills. His artistic talents distinguished him from his peers throughout his childhood, and he began his study of architecture as a teenager. When Williams was in high school, a teacher advised him that he'd never succeed as an architect. Black people wouldn't be able to afford to hire him, and white people wouldn't deign to. This conversation was a major event in Williams' young life. By his own account, it had never occurred to him that race would complicate his professional choices. At this moment, many young people would have abandoned their dream, as I very nearly did in a similar moment during my own high school career, 90 years later at the Philadelphia High School for Creative and Performing Arts. In my senior year, a teacher told me that I shouldn't apply to New York University, the school I'd fallen in love with, because it wasn't a place for people from humble beginnings. For a while, I believed him. The weight of a few words from an adult can be unbearable for a child. As Williams told it, his teacher seemed to think he was doing an unduly ambitious kid a favor by bringing him down to earth. I believe my own teacher thought he was doing the same. In both cases, the discouragement ultimately acted as a catalyst, not a deterrent. When I stopped being heartbroken, I was livid. I was 17 years old and at the top of my class. Who was this man to tell me I was overreaching? I sent in my application at the last minute and I went to NYU. Williams emerged from his own crisis with his commitment to architecture redoubled. His childlike ambition transformed into an adult's iron will to succeed. In I Am a Negro, his 1937 essay for American Magazine, Williams wrote of a drive that propelled him through the early years of his career. Quote, I wanted to vindicate every ability I had. I wanted to acquire new abilities. I wanted to prove that I, as an individual, deserved a place in the world. End quote. Williams went on to design municipal buildings, banks, churches, hospitals, motels, university halls, secondary schools, funeral homes, public housing projects, celebrity estates, and thousands of family homes. If you have ever spent an afternoon driving around Los Angeles, you have seen a Williams building or two. Williams' story is one I believe only could have taken place in Los Angeles. When he began his work as an architect in the 1910s, much of the Los Angeles we know today was a collection of dirt roads, farms, and oil fields. He officially opened his own office in 1923, right as the population of Los Angeles County reached one million. 
The booming city had three factors that allowed him to flourish. Lots of money, lots of land, and a handful of wealthy white people liberal or desperate enough to commission a young black architect. Subtract any one of those factors and his big story would shrink until it disappeared. Hancock Park provides a good example of how Williams's career developed. The neighborhood was established in the early 1920s while Williams was busy setting up his solo practice. He was given a chance to prove his worth with a series of commissions in this neighborhood, though he could not have built his own home there. Hancock Park was protected by a 50-year restrictive covenant ensuring that the only non-white people who could call it home were live-in servants. This was true of many of the cities and neighborhoods where Williams did his early work. After years of violence, LA's restrictive covenants were a kinder, gentler way to keep neighborhoods white. With these genteel restrictions in place, homeowners could take comfort in the knowledge that the undesirable population would stay where it belonged. Word about Williams's impeccable work spread through Los Angeles's exclusive neighborhoods. In Hancock Park and Flint Ridge and Pasadena and Beverly Hills, one Williams home, and it was important to him that they be thought of as homes, not houses, became two, which became a dozen. By the time he retired in 1973, there were more than 2,000 Paul R. Williams homes in Southern California. Sometimes people who had seen his work and heard his name would come into his office, only to be shocked to find that he was black. Some turned and left, but others stayed out of politeness. For these people, Williams taught himself a brilliant trick. He learned how to draw upside down. A skittish prospective client could be drawn in by the magic of watching the home of their dreams appear on the table in front of them without the impropriety of sitting next to the black architect. When I began my project, this and other stories about Williams' knack for turning indignities into triumphs intrigued me. How did it feel to design homes and neighborhoods where he wouldn't have been allowed to live? How did he unwind from the incredible stress of having to defer to people who would enjoy the benefits of his brilliance and labor without fully respecting him as a human being? When designing an intimate space for a client too prejudiced to shake his hand, did he view his work as a subversive act or something he had to do to survive? Williams's white contemporaries could find work by way of a signature style and the cult of personality. Williams had to work without ego, shifting to meet each client's demands. The result is a body of work that demonstrates incredible dexterity. Williams designed Monterey colonials and Tudor revivals and modernist bungalows. He could move deftly between historicist and contemporary styles and often found clever ways to blend the new and the old. He believed in designing to precisely suit the needs of each client and built his reputation by giving even his smallest commissions his full attention. Williams also believed in making good architecture accessible to all. In two books published in the mid-1940s, The Small Home of Tomorrow and its follow-up, New Homes for Today, Williams offered the average American dreaming of building their ideal family home dozens of floor plans to consider. With simple but evocative names like Sunshine Matter, Shangri-La Cottage, the Country Gentleman, and the San Fernando, these plans were designed to be scaled up or down to meet the needs of different families. His work on public housing projects can be linked to his commitment to elevating his community and his belief that everyone deserves a dignified place to live. As the head of a team assembled by the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles, Williams planned the Pueblo do Rio housing project in South LA in the early 1940s. In the early 1950s, Williams designed Watts' Nickerson Gardens, which remains the largest housing project in the West. Notably, Nickerson Gardens was a key site in both the Watts Rebellion in 1965 and the Watts Gang Truce, signed on April 28, 1992, the day before the officers who beat Rodney King were acquitted. The fates of Williams' structures vary. An untold number have been remodeled beyond recognition or destroyed. Most exist in a semi-altered state, some slowly run down by time, others well-kept with subtle additions and updates. The homes he designed for Frank Sinatra and Dave Chazen were raised, but the first AME Church and the Founders Church of Religious Science are still serving their communities. His Broadway Federal Savings and Loan building burned down in 1992, 
but his Golden State Mutual Life Insurance building still stands, now the headquarters of the South Central Los Angeles Regional Center. The La Concha Motel in Las Vegas is gone, but its lobby still stands as the visitor center of that city's neon museum. The long vacant Angeles Funeral Home Building in South Central LA has been transformed into an affordable housing development called the Paul R. Williams Apartments. In early episodes of the AMC television show Fear the Walking Dead, Williams' Woodrow Wilson High School building appears as Paul R. Williams High School, a subtle nod from someone involved in the production. Williams' own Lafayette Square home is, at the time of this writing, in the process of being faithfully restored to its original glory. I'm happy to report that I'm not the only one doing work about Williams. The Paul R. Williams Project, run by the Memphis chapter of the AAA and the University of Memphis Art Museum, is currently at the forefront of Williams scholarship. Volunteers from the nonprofit organization in U.S. Modernist are diligently combing through records, debunking false claims made by dishonest or willfully ignorant real estate agents, hoping to use Williams's name to add value to their properties. Organizations like Esoteric and Save Iconic Architecture spread the word about Williams as part of greater efforts to honor the history of Los Angeles. Royal Kennedy Rogers in Kathy McCampbell Vance's documentary film, Hollywood's Architect, tells Williams' story in detail. The USC School of Architecture and the Getty Research Institute have recently acquired Williams' archives, opening the door for exciting new scholarship and research. And Williams' granddaughter, Karen Elise Hudson, has written books about her grandfather that are invaluable resources for those of us who treasure his work. The story of my work about Paul Williams is all tied up with my personal milestones. Learning to drive and learning Los Angeles by car, my pregnancy with my second child and lugging camera equipment and a big belly around strangers' homes, quitting my administrative job and beginning to teach photography, figuring out that I could be a decent mother and a committed artist at the same time. I learned a lot about myself doing this work and the work continues. It may continue until I can no longer manage a camera. When I look at Williams's meticulous designs, I'm reminded that there is no hurry. It took Williams more than 50 years to complete his work. Why shouldn't it take me just as long to study it? So far, I have photographed over two dozen Williams structures intimately and a few dozen more superficially from the street. The first Williams building I photographed, a handsome mid-century ranch house in LA's View Park neighborhood, turned out not to have been designed by Paul Williams at all. I learned from the architect Frank Escher that the house was designed by Claude Coyne, a partner at Paul Williams and Associates. By then, View Park number one, a dreamy picture of palm fronds leaning against a foggy plate glass window, had become the most widely distributed image from the project, appearing in Aperture and Harper's. Another photograph from the house had been printed in the Los Angeles Times. After much internal debate, I decided to keep the pictures from the View Park house in the body of work. That first shoot had set the tone for the rest of the project, and the work had been done under the banner of the Williams name, if not by Williams himself. I continue to be stunned by the generosity of those whose homes I visit. So many people have given me so much of their time and attention. I'm grateful for the hours of labor performed, invisible to me before my arrival. Floors scrubbed, mirrors polished, clutter tucked away. I'm thankful for the people I have come to know. The married pair of movie producers with the breathtaking art collection, the set of kindly Gen X lawyers with three kids and some amazing LA punk memorabilia, the college professor with a fascinating background in entertainment and politics, the granddaughter diligently tending to the family home. These people, house proud and justifiably so, welcomed me and let me see how they live. I spent two and a half years patiently waiting to be granted access to the home Williams designed for himself and his wife, a sleek white international style house that resembles a futuristic riverboat run aground in the middle of Los Angeles. I gained entry to a house once owned by William Holden, later by Denzel Washington, when the current owner spied me through a window as I tried to take a clandestine picture from across the street. As soon as I said Paul Williams, his look of suspicion turned to one of warmth and understanding. I have scoured Zillow listings for Paul Williams houses and cold-called real estate agents. 
I have been introduced to property owners via friends of friends of friends. On several occasions, William's homeowners read about my work somewhere, sought out my contact information, and invited me over. There are sites that turned out to be great disappointments and others that exceeded all expectations. There are also my white whale houses, beauties whose owners I unsuccessfully courted for months. I still hope to get to those someday. It is not the beauty of Williams's work that inspires me, though it does bring me a lot of pleasure. It is the thought of him grinding day after day in this city, patiently building his practice and proving his detractors wrong that makes me return to his work. My photographs of Williams's buildings are as much a tribute to his labor and persistence as they are a tribute to his talent. I am proud to live and work in Paul Williams's city. If Williams could become one of the most notable architects of the 20th century here, what can my children become in the 21st? This is a fascinating time to live in Los Angeles, though I suppose that can be said of any moment in the city's history. A city can change so fast. Tracking Williams's work is my way of making sense of this sprawling, fascinating place I call home. Paul Williams was a faithful citizen of Los Angeles who used his abundant gifts to change the face of the city. Los Angeles has changed without him and will continue to change in unknown ways, but his mark is indelible. Los Angeles is known as a city that likes to forget its history, but it will always remember Paul Revere Williams. I see there are a couple questions already, but I'm going to talk a little tiny bit more about the project before jumping into questions. One thing I want to talk a little bit about is how the book actually came about and kind of the chronology of the project. I first heard about this idea of photographing Paul Williams in the summer of 2016, and I began photographing buildings designed by him that December, which is around the same time that the AIA announced that he was posthumously receiving the AIA gold medal. So the whole time I was working on this project, interest in him was growing. His name was kind of being spread through other channels. And then my project had its first exhibition and people saw it there. And more and more, and more people saw my work and became interested in him and connected my work to him and so on. And then I wrote a text that ended up getting me invited to present at LACMA. And during this conference at LACMA, the publishers from Angel City Press came. And that's where I met them. And they invited me to come pitch the book. And I, I pitched it. And it happened. And I am here with you tonight. And a book came out a couple days ago. Um, and the timing of the release is really interesting, too. Over the summer, it was announced that the Getty Research Institute and the USC School of Architecture had jointly acquired Paul R. Williams's archives, which were thought to be lost um, since 1992. But it turned out that what burned down in 92 when the Broadway Federal Savings and Loan Building burned down uh, was actually uh, his office records. So his correspondence, I think mostly letters and, and just general office papers. Mm -hmm but all of the plans and things that seemed to have been gone were actually very safe and are now being cataloged and digitized and will at some point be available for uh, scholarly research, which is incredibly exciting to me and I think a number of other people. Another question that I get sometimes is, how I decide which buildings to photograph and how I get into the buildings. I talked a little bit about how I gain access to buildings in the text, but in terms of what I photograph for the project that is in the book, um, the decision that I made was that I wanted to really focus on buildings that he designed by himself. So the project doesn't include, for example, the Beverly Hills Hotel, which he is really famous for having um, done a partial redesign of and for designing the cafe and the logo. But because he didn't design the initial structure, I stayed away from it for this project. And there are lots of other structures like that, that maybe now that I've kind of gotten this part of the project out and you can see uh, all these structures that really just have his name on them. I can begin to look at 
structures that he is connected to, but not necessarily the sole uh, creator of. Let's see. Um, and talking about uh, what I'm going to do now and whether the work is finished. I have recently shot a Paul Williams building just uh, last month, the first Paul Williams building since early this year when I turned my book materials in. So I'm at this point trying to figure out uh, what life the project has now, whether it is the same project about Paul R. Williams, whether it is a different project that's related. I haven't figured out how things will fit together yet. But because there is so much more of his work out there and now so much potential for research and learning more about his work, I do want to continue my exploration of it. And I think I'm about ready to open it up for questions. Okay, so I'll start with the question that got the most votes. Um, it's from Jeff, and there are a couple of questions within his one question. Um, have you shot architecture before? And can you talk about the intimacy so present in many of these shots? I had not shot architecture in any kind of formal way before. So I had um, I'd done some photographs of myself at my husband's grandfather's house. And it's clear in that body of work that I'm totally fascinated with the house. Like there are lots of ways that um, the house is creeping into the project. There are portraits of me in the house, but there are also a ton of shots of just the house itself and the things in the house. So when I was asked to do this project, at first I felt really unqualified for it and I didn't know how I was gonna do it. But then I thought about my previous work and specifically my interest in domestic structures and try to figure out how I could apply that to uh, photographing Paul Williams's work. I started looking at architectural photography and trying to figure out what architectural photography was supposed to look like. And I figured out that I didn't love most of it or that I wasn't interested in making photographs that really looked like traditional photographs, traditional architectural photographs. I wanted to make photographs that gave you the feeling of actually visiting a space, of being in a space, of being able to look closely and carefully at things versus a big picture of an entire room and there's a chair here and there's all this other stuff going on over there and it's hard to know uh, where your eye should rest. I wanted to kind of strip all of that out and that's, that's part of why the work is in black and white too, that kind of stripping out of extraneous detail so that you can focus on the actual architecture. Oh, oh wait, there's another part of the question. It was about, um, shoot, the question's gone. It was oh, about- Oh, the question was, um, what did you learn from meditating on these spaces designed by this artist? Each one is so different. Um, it seems like I learned different things from different spaces. I learned uh, about him, that he was meticulous, that he was interested in lots of different kinds of things, and that he was interested in bringing a really incredible level of detail and care to all of these various projects on different ends of the scale in terms of uh, how expensive the projects were to put together and how much money they would bring into his office. You know, he, he seemed to uh, put care into everything. Okay, uh, next question. The buildings or homes that were remodeled beyond recognition, do you think they knew what they had? And that's a question from Tiffany. Some people did and some didn't. Um, Paul Williams died in 1980, but he retired in 1973. And the first books about him by his granddaughter didn't come out until maybe the very late 80s, very early 90s. So between the time he retired and her books came out and people started talking about his work through her books, um, I don't know how much conversation there was about him in uh, the architecture world. I know that he certainly always had fans, especially people interested in kind of grand Hollywood homes. But I don't know, um, you know, if, if he was really part of the conversation. So I think in that time, 
there was there were a lot of houses that kind of slipped through the cracks and didn't uh, didn't receive the care they should have. But there are still houses that are being demolished today. Last year, um, there was a beautiful Williams home in Toluca Lake that was uh, illegally demolished sort of all at once. And the neighbors all freaked out because it was this really important house to them. And there was another house like that in Hancock Park where the person who sold the house sold it to someone who they were assured understood the value of the house and the value of what they had. But instead, what they really wanted was the land underneath. And it's kind of uh, easier to ask forgiveness than permission in terms of real estate here in LA sometimes. So I think that it's easier to knock something down and pay the fine and just put your McMansion up than it is to uh, go through the proper channels or to, you know, actually maintain the home that you purchased and promised to care for. All right, and we have a question from Katie. How do you guide students to photograph interior spaces? What do you suggest they look for? I've talked a little bit with students about photographing their own spaces. And as, a, as an educator, one thing I try to be really careful about is not asking students to reveal too much. So I would never um, say, you know, photograph every room of your house, show us exactly what your life is like because students deserve their privacy and people live all kinds of different ways. So I think that the way I photographed the Williams buildings, which was a largely designed to give people in those homes their privacy and protect, you know, the things that they had in their house and whatever was going on around me. I think that some of that is, can be transferable um, when talking to students. I think that looking for light is is really what I'm doing a lot of the time and what I'm what I try to get students to do. Um, so much of what's interesting to me is light and shadow. And that's also another um, another reason that this work is in black and white and not something, I mean, when I was when I decided it was more about kind of unifying everything and making sure that a house that was designed in the 60s looked, you know, could blend in on the next to a house that was designed in the 30s and totally different eras, totally different styles and the black and white kind of unified them. But the black and white also really highlights that light and shadow. So I try to give students at least once a semester an assignment where they photograph in black and white so they can begin to think about light and shadow and light as a subject or the absence of light as a subject. All right, we have a question from David. Were you ever able to see slash visit the Batman house before it was destroyed by fire? Uh, 380 San Rafael in Pasadena overlooking the Arroyo. The Batman house burned down in 2005. So it was before I began this project. I think it was 2005, which was before I began this project and before I even lived in Los Angeles. But I did photograph the, the site where the house once stood. There's um, the kind of brick uh, staircase that's in front of the house is still there. And then up on the top of the hill where the house used to sit, they're building something new. So in the book, there are a few photographs of the old house that survived and the new structure that's going up now. Great. We have, um, so the next question is, did Paul R. Williams design the theme building in the center of LA airport? He did not design the theme building. Paul R. Williams was on the team of architects who um, worked on the master plan for Los Angeles airport. So he was involved in the design of the airport overall, but it's the theme building, which is so often attributed to him, I would say is not a Paul Wickham structure, though he may have been involved in some of the behind the scenes planning. And what was the most surprising fact about Paul R. Williams you'd learned during your project? Hmm. 
I mean, my, my earliest research about him was really filled with a lot of surprises. The volume of his work was really surprising. The, the number that gets thrown around is 3,000 buildings that he designed. So that was really fascinating and uh, something that was really exciting to get into. A lot of people were really surprised this year to learn that his archives survived, um, but that's something that I'd been hearing rumors about for years. So first I was surprised to learn that they might actually still exist and then surprised to learn that it really did seem like they existed and then wonderfully surprised by the joint acquisition of the work by the Getty Research Institute and the USC School of Architecture. Uh, this is a question from Natasha. Who are some of your other favorite Los Angeles architects? Oh gosh, that's a really tough question. As someone who doesn't know a whole lot about architecture and you know knows mostly things about uh, one architect. It's really difficult to talk about other architects. Um, I do tend to like uh, mid-century houses a whole lot. Um, let's see. I did a talk at Schindler House a few years ago, and I thought that that was an absolutely fascinating space um, because of the way that it was designed, that it was designed for two families to coexist. I thought that that was uh, really, really fascinating. Something that I'm interested in just in general is the history of utopian communities and um, communal living. So uh, Schindler's house that he built for himself in West Hollywood is a subject of fascination for me because it was designed for communal living. And do you have a favorite building designed by Williams that you photographed? The favorite building that I photographed is um, the mausoleum at Hillside Memorial Park, which also is right next to another William structure, the Al Jolson Memorial Shrine. Um, but overall, my favorite thing to do is photograph the houses and be surprised by them because they, they're in all sorts of different styles, as I said. Um, that that's that's my favorite part of the project that is what is so exciting and that's my favorite thing and i don't know that i could pick a single favorite one because there's just so much joy in so many of the experiences and in having conversations with the people who are the stewards of these structures okay and we have one last question uh, unless people are going to throw in last minute questions feel free to do so what do you believe is Paul R. Williams' greatest contribution to the Los Angeles landscape? What do you think is his enduring legacy? One thing that's really amazing about Los Angeles is that there are so many different kinds of structures here. There's no architectural consistency. You have styles from all over the world, from all kinds of different eras kind of smushed in next to each other. And when Paul Williams was beginning his career at, in the early 1920s, there was still so much land to build on and so much money coming into Los Angeles. So I believe that he contributed to the way we think about Los Angeles, the way we perceive Los Angeles and the fact that you can see uh, one style of house and see a completely different style of house next door that kind of, um, all over the placeness of the architecture. I also believe that he contributed this idea of, um, you know, the Hollywood luxury, these grand staircases and the big bathtubs and all that, all of that kind of glamorous architectural uh, stuff that we think about when we think about LA was a big part of the work that he was doing. Uh, we just got another question. Uh, it's from Linda. Do you know about the reportedly PRW home on Circle Drive in Whittier? I only know it from real estate listings, but it looks like much original work is still there. I did not know about that, but I will investigate it. There's still, you know, send me, send me your leads, please. I love to find out about structures I hadn't heard about before and research them and try to figure out if somebody will let me inside for a few hours to take pictures. 
Okay, if there are no other questions, I'm gonna jump back on screen. Oh, Tiffany just asked, uh, will there be signed copies at Romans? Uh, we don't have any signed copies available at the moment, but we'll definitely pass that request onto our will call department and see if we can arrange that in the near future. Um, but with that said, thank you so much, Jana, for your lovely presentation, for sharing such phenomenal photographs with us. Um, and thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. Uh, we're really grateful for all of your support during this very strange time for independent bookstores. And again, if you would like to support our bookstore by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. And to learn more about our upcoming virtual events, just check out our website's calendar and follow us on social media. And our next event is scheduled for mon Monday, September 21st at 6 p.m. with PJ O'Rourke. And joining him will be Christopher Buckley. And I think that about wraps up everything. Thank you again. Have a good evening, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you for coming. Bye. Good night.